was, I'm convinced of it. I, I, the way the world, it was, I don't believe this COVID virus is the ushering, ushering end of the end, but I believe it is a dress rehearsal. It's teaching our country how to give up their freedoms at, at any given moment. It's teaching us how to run for cover and, and how, how people can control us with fear. And that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. And so, you know, I just feel like it's right around the corner. So one of the things that Jesus said, uh, the title today is, I'm going to be talking about spirit, soul, and body, but I'm going to try to do it from another angle. Uh, if you, in Luke chapter 18, this is one of the things, after he told a parable about the, the widow woman and the unrighteous judge, and at the end of the parable, he, he was talking about that the, the, here's this weak woman who had no other remedy but to go bang on the, the unrighteous judge's door until he gave her what belonged to her. And so, um, in doing so, at the end of it, you know, she, he said, I, I don't fear God nor man, but yet because you continually weary me, I'm going to give you what you ask. And then at the very end of that, Jesus concluded by saying, nevertheless, when, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And so I'm just, I'm just of the opinion that, to be honest with you, I'll give you some running room. I just feel like that it's important to Jesus that he finds faith when he comes back, that his church that his body will be operating in faith. And you know, during the 80s and, and early 90s, you know, the faith movement came out and it kind of got a bunch of people, I feel like, off track because it, faith became about uh, getting stuff and manipulating uh, spiritual law instead of walking in a, in a place where we're in constant contact and being, be, being able to be used by God because he walks by, lives by, operates in faith. He doesn't ask us to do something that he's not willing to do. In fact, it's not that it's not just a sacrifice. It's kind of like if I want to go to Portugal, I need to learn how to speak Portuguese. If I'm going to be efficient and, and, and be able to, to live there and, and communicate and, and operate, well, if we're going to operate in the kingdom of heaven, we've got to learn how to walk by faith. We've got to learn how to talk in faith. Amen. That's good. Okay. I'm ready today. Okay. In Proverbs 23, 7, and this is so imperative. It's like, you know, I, I remember I saw a statistic the other day that in the, in the world, the United States ranks like 15th when it comes to math and science skills in our students, but we're ranked second in feeling good about ourselves. Well, <laughs> that's great. You know, we can't add or subtract or read or write, but we can feel good. Well, that's good. I want you to feel good, but I want you to feel good not because of what's going on around you or that participation trophy that you got or because 15 people gave you a like today. I want you to feel good because you know who you are and whose you are. And, and Proverbs 23 says, says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. It's so important that how you think in your heart, not how somebody is externally projecting that on you, but how you've already, it emanates out of you. Your, your soul is the well from which you draw the benefits of your salvation. 2 Corinthians 7, 2. This is what Paul said. Now, I want, I want to talk to some people this morning, because when I first got born again, I'm going to tell you something. I didn't get, I didn't get saved when I was six hours old and, and just out of the womb. I had a life where I lived out here, and I was not somebody that you would think was a Christian. You know why? Because I wasn't. And so, 22 years of my life, I lived for myself. I lived doing whatever I wanted to do. I lived my life thinking I was a good old boy, but in reality, I was working for the devil. And so when I got born again, it was imperative for, to me to let the world know that I was different. I was a changed person. And that I was no longer associated with that world. I was no longer a part of that world. That I, I had found a new kingdom and a new purpose and a new life. And I was not even the same person anymore. Bob, if you don't mind, I'll tell you this story one more time. But right after I got saved, Bob said this is our best friends. We were raised literally in two baby beds, one next to each other. Our parents were friends. And so we grew up our whole lives playing ball together, going to school together, camping out, the whole thing. We went, even went to the University of Alabama together. Well, Bob came home in May, and I had, uh, I had to spend one more summer because I changed my, my major. And so during that time, I got born again. And I came home, and uh, Hartzell was playing Decatur, and I went to the football game late and because I had spoken at a revival. I'm 10 days old. It was terrible. Don't worry about trying to find the DVD. But anyway, so I showed up at the ball game, and I was wearing a tie. And, and Bob says, hey, man, where you been? And I said, well, I was at this revival. And he said, was your brother preaching? And I said, no, it was I. And I thought all the blood drained out of Bob's face. And, and so, but he didn't say anything. And so the next weekend, we made a plan to go see a movie again. We went to the movie. And anyway, yada, 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 six months later, Bob calls me. Uh, I got the privilege of praying with Bob, leading him to pray the same prayer that I had prayed. And, and he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And in his testimony, he said this. He said, I, he said that that encounter, he said, when I saw Charlie again, 
He said, it looked like the boy I'd grown up with, but it wasn't the same guy. He said, when we were sitting in the movie, Charlie was watching the movie, but I was looking at Charlie because I could realize something was different about him. Well, let me tell you something. If we don't have that difference, then we don't have anything. If there's no change, if there's no obvious fruit of his presence in our life, we don't have anything to sell. We're just, we're just another club. We're just another, you know, cult running around here shaking our maracas. And I'm telling you, there's got to be more to what we're doing. And it's because there is a change that can take place and will take place. Paul wrote to these guys in Corinth and he said, receive us. We have wronged no one. How could Paul say I've wronged no one when he was dragging Christians off to the lion's den? How could he say I've wronged nobody when he, when he was the guy, he was Saul, the guy that would come and invade their homes and arrest them and put them in prison? How could Saul make that comment? Because he was no longer Saul, he was Paul. And he, he changed his name to let them know, look, I know I look like the guy that came and got you, but I am not that same guy anymore. Right. He changed his name That's good. because he was no longer the same. Acts chapter 7. <laughs> Pick up a sign. That's right. I'm about to put it around where I grab them. Wait, wait. I like signs and wonders. Uh, who was called, then Saul, who was called Paul, they had to make this distinction in the book of Acts. Fill with the Spirit. Let's all say that together. Fill with the Spirit. Look intently at him. Next, chain, next thing. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus is speaking to Simon. He said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, or son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father. Who, Jesus said, Who do they say that I am? And, and Peter was the one that said, You know what? You're the Christ. You're the Son of the Living God. Then he got this revelation, even though he was dumb as a bag of rocks. And he said, But my father is in heaven. I also say to you, you are Peter. Now, notice his name is Simon. His father's name was Jonah. But Jesus looked at him and says, You know what? You're not Simon. You know why? Because Simon means unstable as water. You can't, you can't hold it. You ever try to fuck a uh, uh, kid, Madison and Jerry, but Otter, their dog, is a little French bulldog, little, I should say, he's this enormous French bulldog. <laughs> and when you try to pick him up, it's like trying to hold a bag of water. That was Logan's mistake. Logan's uh, characterization is perfect. He'll just squirt right out of your arms. You can't hold him up. And I'm thinking, it's unstable as water. You don't know what it's going to do or where it's going to go. Water is the most destructive force in the world. It can, it can erode away and tear. It can find its own way to get to you, right? Well, Jesus looked at, at Simon, unstable as water, and said, from this day on, I'm going to call you Peter. I'm going to change your name because I'm going to change your destiny. I'm going to quit calling you what everybody else has called you, and I'm going to call you something different. From this point on, you're the rock. Right? Well, yes. that's great. And then Acts chapter 2, by the time they got to the upper room, you know, Peter said, I'm never going to deny you. And Jesus said, oh, you'll deny me three times before the cop crows. And sure enough, that's exactly what Peter did. And he denied who Jesus was three times. And then he heard that rooster crow and he ran off ashamed of himself. And finally, when he came back and he appeared unto Mary, he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter was so distraught that he completely detached himself from the rest of the gang. Even though they all betrayed him, he felt so badly about it. He no longer counted himself as a disciple. Isn't it funny that here's this guy who, you know, that, that is still unstable. Yet Jesus has already given him a new name. But he's not going by that name. He's still going by son. Mm -hmm. But then on the day of Pentecost, he stands up all of a sudden after he gets filled with the Holy Ghost. It says, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, all who dwell in Jerusalem, wait a minute. Just ten days earlier, he's trying to figure out the plan. Jesus is standing on the cloud and he says, Hey, I'm, listen, y'all I'm y'all go to the upper room and don't, don't tarry. I'm going to send you something back. And, and Peter's saying, Wait, are, are we going to go ahead and take over the government? And Jesus is like, This thing may be on Peter. Go to the upper room and wait. And I, it'll all come clear to you. And sure enough, ten days later, when the Holy Spirit fell upon them all, he stands up and says, Listen, let me tell you what's going on. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now suddenly he's got revelation. He's got this prophetic anointing. Where did it come from? Because finally he stepped into his new name. How was he able to do that? Well, let's see. I got a little graphic here. Saul and Peter both got touched with fire. Both of them got filled with the Holy Spirit. And now they're no longer the person they used to be. Saul is no longer Saul. He's Paul because now he's anointed with the fire from heaven. Simon is no longer Simon. He's now Peter because he's been filled with the power of God. Let me tell you something. I don't think being born again is enough for you. If you want a new destiny, you need to be filled with, baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Because right. that will give you a new identity and a new destiny. Amen. Amen. Well, well uh, <laughs> this scripture has been so over, overbaked and everybody just doesn't hear it anymore. 
But I'm going to tell you something. I've heard some chatter around it. Let me tell you what I believe with all my heart. If you get a revelation of, what I'm, of this scripture, everything that had a hold on you cannot have a hold on you anymore and without your permission. But you know what? If you keep buying into the lie, see, here's the thing. If, if, if sin has to let go because of the blood, then everything associated with it has to go. Right. You, can't, you don't just get rid of your spiritual condition that, that goes, that would lead you to hell. You get rid of the spiritual condition that also created all this stuff inside of you. Addictions and bondage and generational curse. I, you don't think we have to go through a laundry list. I just think we need the blood. I just think we need the power of God to come in and transform us from yeah. being darkness into light. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, what is Christ? Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ was the office. It was the place called the Messiah, the anointed one, the place where the, the, that somebody who was a man would come and had God smeared all over him, and that was who he was. That's why John the Baptist says, here's the Lamb of God. That's the one. He's the one that's got God smeared all over him. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Say it with me. New, new creation. creation. Let's do it again. New, new creation. creation. Amen. Why am I saying new creation? Because even when the ark landed and Noah, and Noah got off there, there wasn't one of you on it. There was not one of us on the ark because we're a new creation. We're not men trying to do better. We're not sinners saved by grace. We've been transformed from death into life, from into the very likeness and image and visage of Jesus. He has transformed us. Now, here's the problem with that. When I look in the mirror, it still looks like me. And this is the battle before Jesus comes back. If we're going to walk by faith, we've got to walk by not what we see right. or what we hear. Even what our brain tells us, we've got to go by what his word tells us. Right. And that has to have dom d dominion and authority in our life over every other thought, every other impulse, every other craving. We've got to let that take authority over us. You know, we've almost got to strap ourselves to it and hang on for the ride. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, you know the word behold means you can see it. Now, I can't say this strongly enough in this last hour. If people can't see our relationship with God before we open our mouth, Smith Wigglesworth said, everywhere you go, preach the kingdom. And if it's necessary, open your mouth. Ooh, that's good. Behold, all things have become what? New. Touch your neighbor and say new. <laughs> well, touch them from six feet away. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, this is in the guts of the matter. This is now may God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. I'm sitting at, uh, I'm sitting at Cracker Brown. I'll get to this in a minute. And, and, uh, and to be honest with you, I'm just kind of fresh in this, and I'm, we're, we're meeting with some people at the church, and they're asking questions about how can I look in the mirror, how can I go to the doctor, I mean, how can I look at the symptoms in my life and say I'm healed when everything's hurting, or I see something that's injured, or I see, the, you know, how can I look at myself and say I'm no longer Simon, but I'm Peter? Because it, if you look at this the, in the flesh, if you look at the view you've been given, you, you, you can't do it without lying. How, what is the difference between uh, calling things that be not and just telling a flat out lie? Well, it's whether or not you believe it or not. So I'm sitting in, hang on just a second. I'm sitting in Cracker Barrel. Oh, where are my pictures? I got this, I got this, uh, I'll have to go back. I got this picture. They're cleaning up the table. And they stacked up the dishes and the, 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 the glasses, and I go, that's it. How can I look at this and say I'm healed? Because we're three parts to us. You see these? I punched holes in these, these are bad shape. I need some new ones. But there's three parts to you. Just like Jesus, there's three parts to the, 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 the Godhead. There's the Father, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Genesis chapter 1, he said, let us make man in our own image. Let us make man in our own image. He said that he scooped down into the earth and he formed him a body. And then he put, he breathed breath into him and he became a living soul. He put breath in him and he became a living soul. The soul was ignited and came alive when the spirit came inside of him. 
Let me say that again. This soul, this, this part of him that, that lives in this earth, that is, this is where you, this is where you think, what you feel, what you want is generated inside your soul. It's your awareness of you being here. Your spirit brings life to that, or it brings death to that. Depends on which, which, if this is born again, if this part of you is been regenerated by the blood of Jesus, I can look at that guy, and everything that's true about Jesus is true right here. Everything the Bible says is true about me is true right here. But it's still inside of who I am, what I think, what I feel, what I want. And we're all living in a, in a, in a, a world that's fallen. And so if I'm getting all my, my information from here, we're good. If I'm getting all my information from here, then my soul is tainted and still thinks it is lost and separated from God. I've got to turn the floor around. All right. Come on. My soul is a guy who lives in the earth, but it's not driven by the earth. It's going to, be, it's going to get all this information from the spirit. Yeah, that's good. This, is your earth suit. this thing you're living in, this flesh is the thing that you have to have to be on this earth. If you don't have a body, you have to leave you. That we, that's what funerals are about, is that suddenly our spirit leaves our body, and now this body is dead. And anybody that's ever been to a funeral, you look in that box, I'm telling you, there's no way you can tell me, oh, they look so good. No, they look dead. There's nobody in there anymore. Be like, if I take this vest off, it's no longer me. Right now, it's, it's carrying the shape of me, and, it, and it, it, it conforms to my image. But when I leave it and I take it off, I'm no longer in it. It doesn't look like me anymore. It's just what I was wearing to get here. That's why Jesus had to come through Mary to come to this earth legally. That's why he had to be born of a virgin, because he didn't want to come through the seed of Adam and carry Because Adam had already been tainted with sin. He came through the, the Holy Spirit, overshadowed Mary, and he came into this earth, and then he came through the legal way to get here. It's through the womb. Who you, uh, you're, this is really fun today. I hate that bass. Your earth suit is the thing that, you, that actually gives you authority in the earth. Has no mind or will of its own. It only responds to training, exposure, and thus can be changed. Let me say that again. That, you know what? When I, I was just playing the guitar a minute ago, and I remember that when I first picked one up, I couldn't. I just could not make that F chord. I could not do these things. And I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And now, now I can do it with my, my eyes closed. Why? Because I've trained my flesh to act a certain way. What if it's been trained to crave alcohol? It's been trained to crave drugs and, and addicted to substances and, and tobacco and pornography and lust and grief. it can be trained, untrained or retrained to do something else right, right. it just does what you tell it to do right. whoever's in charge of this dictates how it acts good, that's good your spirit is who you really are this is who you are you were created in the in the kingdom of heaven, and when your parents got together and conceived a child, that's what came. Is you came inside that little embryo, and you became that person in there. The, the, uh, life didn't begin at conception. Life began and let there be life. That's where life began. And so you came here, and even though you may have been a surprise to your parents, you're not a surprise to God. He has no throwaways. He has no accidents. He has nobody that he you know, didn't, didn't need them. They're, you're all part of a plan. You're all part of his plan. And so you need to seek him out instead of finding your approval and your value from everybody around you. You are already so valuable to God that if you were the only one here, he would have sent Jesus to die for you anyway. Your spirit is who you really are, the part of you that will live forever. No matter what you do on this earth, you're going to live forever. You're either going to live with God because of your choices, or you're going to live apart from God forever. But you will live forever. Right. The new birth, the place where the new birth takes place is, is in your spirit. This is where, when I'm born again, this is why this changes immediately. 150 things that weren't true of me before became true of me immediately. Now, you know what? This didn't change immediately. The way I think about things, the way that I feel, the stuff I want didn't change immediately, not all of it. And, and certainly, on the outside, you couldn't see a difference. Immediately, you couldn't. But as I, it's kind of like, as radioactive as this is, suddenly when I start letting the, the influence of the, of the Spirit of God loose in my life, it suddenly begins to change the way I think about things, the stuff I want, the, 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 how I feel, how I think, and what I want. And as I do those things, and those things change, I start to take dominion over my flesh. And therefore, the king is still king. And, and, and even though he's in here hidden in my, in my spirit, he starts to show up in my flesh. That's good. That's good. Running chainsaws. 
Well, here's the thing I want to talk to you about today, if I can, real quickly. This is the dude right here. This is the guy, okay? Your soul is your conscious self. It's your awareness of being, your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's the hard drive of your computer. It controls what you think, how you feel, and what you want. It controls what you think, how you feel, and what you want. This is our essence of life. Everything about this life goes through right here. Now, here's the problem. I'm going to try to position this. I had a really cool picture that I worked on, but it's gone. This is what happens. Between the flesh and the spirit is your soul. Depending on where you're getting your information is how you're living your life. Wow. If you're getting your information about your life from how you feel, those, those impulses in your brain, those chemicals in your brain, how many people will suddenly like you, how much love they'll give you, how much respect they'll give you, how much money you make, how, many, how much stuff you got, then this is always volatilely moving with the changing of those forces. But if you're anchored to this, to where, you know what, I know that you might have a lead, I'm fully persuaded, he's able, that I know where I'm going, I know where I've been, and I know who's I am, then it doesn't matter what's going on over here. This never changes because, it, because he never changes. Woo. Good. That's all good. I remember the story when, they, when Peter and John went to the temple right to the upper room and they're baptized with the Holy Spirit and there was a guy sitting there who had been lame from birth and, and he looked up them he looked up at, at them expecting to receive something from them. And he and they and <clears throat> they looked down at him and Peter said, or John said, uh, silver and gold is not what I have. Actually, what he said in the Greek is silver and gold is not what you need. Notice there's a lot of times in your life right now where they, you think you know what you need and you really don't. You think it's this, but God said if you get this, it'll wipe all that out. And so he grabbed a hold of his arms and he jerked him up off the ground. And the guy had been lame since birth. It says that he began to uh, he he began to go leaping, praising God. You go back and say it again. He, he, and he leaping up stood, Acts chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. He leaping stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. Now watch this. And the people saw him walking and praising God. They did not acknowledge that he was leaping. Why is that important? Because for some reason in our world, well, I've, I've heard my whole life, well, we don't, need, we don't need feelings to drive the train. I get it. But we need feelings to live. Everything I, about my life is centered around feeling something. And so if we've been taught to not acknowledge the importance of this, to keep it in check, to keep it healthy before God, then we, we're walking around quoting scripture that is not present in our life. Okay. Because this is still miserable, empty, and, and damaged. Right. And so he was leaping, walking, and praising God. They saw the physical work. They knew that he, had, he was praising God in the spirit, but they forgot to acknowledge that he felt better. I just think that's awesome. I think that's a well. Well, uh. Nah, 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 Y'all trying to find that? Why is this? Because people saw what they valued, the spiritual response, the physical response. But like I said, they didn't have to notice or value the soul, how it made him feel as he was leaping. In 3 John 2, he says this, Beloved, I wish above all things. All things. All is a big word. It means everything. God, John is writing what Jesus is, is telling him to write. And, and he's writing this epistle back and he said, listen, I wish, brethren, above all things, that you prosper and be in health as your soul prosper. In other words, my prosperity, my health is determined by how well this is operating. Everything in my life, the, how successful I am, how fulfilled I am, everything in my life, whether I'm healthy or sick, is all centered around here. And if you're continually thinking what they told you, then you're never going to have a breakthrough into what God has already made right. you to be. You're not trying to get it here. You are already this guy. That's but good. you've got to put this in charge of this yes. so that it can take the meaning. That's so good. This. Philippians chapter 2. What about this thing? Well, in Philippians 2.12, we said we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched 
with the feelings of our infirmities. Aren't you glad Jesus is seated at the right hand? Because God the Father doesn't know what it's like to be hungry. God the Father doesn't know what it's like to be afraid. God the Father doesn't know what it's like to be betrayed. But Jesus does. We have a high priest sitting at the right hand who's been touched with every feeling, every anomaly that you could possibly think of, not only physically but mentally, and so that the soul sickness that you're feeling when you feel alone, when you feel betrayed, when you feel like you know you're not worth anything. Jesus has been through every bit of that. You know when he was hanging on the cross, don't you know the devils were taunting him? Saying, look at him, they've all run from him. You spent you, you you put everything on the line and roll the dice and now you're nailed to this cross and nobody's coming. Don't you think he had an opportunity when his soul went to hell? When his soul went to hell and was suffering for they said on the third day, but there were two days before that where he had to sit there and listen to all this, this rhetoric. He knows what it's like to have come through what you're going through right now. And he's the one that can lead you out. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart does good like a medicine. Let's just say, for, for just argument's sake, what if we got a hold of who we are in Jesus Christ? And we begin to let that filter down into our thinking. Could it be that our, the thing that's destroying our mood and causing us to be depressed or discouraged or anxious or fearful or bipolar or schizophrenic, could it be that if we to inject something other than a chemical with the power of God into it, could we not possibly bring healing to our emotions, healing to our thought life? I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with medicine, but it's not a fix. This is a cure. In Good News Bible, it literally says this, being cheerful keeps you healthy. It is slow death to be gloomy all the time. Here we are trapped in our homes with our masks on, not able to come into human contact, and we're just sitting ducks for the devil to come. This is the time we've got to learn to walk by faith. This is the time where, you know what? Great. You know what? God's pulled away every little easy thing from us. We're having to do this on our own. We're having to do it as if we're hiding in caves like the rest of the world is because they lose their life to have a church meeting that we've taken so much for granted. All right. And he's teaching us, look, you need to get your mind right. You need to get a hold of those, those thoughts. You need to take every thought captive and bring them into the, under the obedience of Christ, under the obedience of the anointing. Your soul is the mediator between your spirit and your flesh. Your reality is determined by where you receive your truth. Where are you getting the truth from? What is the most true thing to you? Is it what God says? Or is it what the world is telling you? Is it when they stand up on that press conference and tell you how bad the coronavirus is? Or is it in here where he says that Isaiah 53, 5, that he was wounded for our transgressions? Bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. What's, what's getting in my head? Which one of these two are getting in my head? What's taking dominion over? You know, what, what about Psalm 91 where it tells me that uh, a thousand fall by my side, ten thousand by my right hand? You know what? I, well, I'm afraid to go out in public. Right? You know what? I know in whom I have believed, and I've got an angelic escort, and the angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear him and delivers them. Now, I'm not saying we go out and taunt and tempt God, but how bad it? we quit living our lives in fear. Amen. Amen. I trust the Lord. <laughs> All done. Thanks for putting that little mess. In Revelation 12, 10, Paul was writing on the Isle of Patmos, and he said, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. The accuser of our brethren who can... And here's what I'm trying to tell you. I had a really cool graphic. I said, I'm not even going to turn around. You said Paul wrote that? Was it John? Paul. I said, sorry, John. Thank you for... So here's the thing. Since this is in control... What is Satan pointing you to all the time? Right here. He wants you to look at this. The Holy Spirit's wanting you to look at this. The devil's accusing you because of this. God's saying, I want you to know who you are because of this. Because, because it's like this camera. Whatever it's focused on is what you're going to see. If I turn it around and point it toward the pond, you're not going to see me anymore. You're going to see the pond. So your focus determines 
your reality and who your, your sense of self is wrapped around what you're staring at. And if you're listening to what the devil said, he's going to point to you everything you ever did wrong. He's going to point to you every sin you've ever committed. He's going to remind you of it every day. He's going to try to bring guilt and shame to you to keep you under his foot, to keep you in bondage, to feel like you're not worthy enough. However, the Word of God says, I've already made you that way. I've already made you in my image. I've already recreated you. You're heaven ready the minute you leave that body. You're going to be with me. You can't get any more righteous than when you've been washed by the blood of Jesus. And if you start to stare at this and meditate on this, suddenly you begin to think that you're that person. And when you begin to think you're that person, you can now take dominion over these desires that war against your war against your soul. And you begin to take dominion over them, and suddenly they don't have any power because they're just waiting to be trained to do what you tell them to do. It's good. There's a cool graphic. James chapter 2, my last scripture. I was outside on my porch one night meditating on this, and, and I heard the scripture, and it's always been used, I think, as some sort of means of being condemned. But he said, James chapter 2, 26, he said, a body, you know, he said, well, we know that faith without works is dead, right? I looked up another version of it, and I like the way it says this. A body that doesn't breathe is dead. In the same way, faith that does nothing is dead. And my point is this. If you, if you don't, you need to do a survey. You need to ask people in your life, do you know that I'm a Christian? Because if they say, really? Then you know what? That faith you claim you've got is dead. Because it's not working. It hasn't done anything. It hasn't changed the way you think about stuff. It hasn't caused you to override you know, those feelings of, of wanting to to be judgmental or to be uh, to seek revenge or to hate a brother or whatever. Those, those commands we've been given in the Bible, if this has not been strapped to that and forced to obey what you, you everything in you feels to do something else, you're going to make yourself do what God tells you to do. If that's not going on and you're still fighting this fight of who's in control, then I'm wondering if maybe we need to check see if this faith that you think you have is really a lie or is it just a memory or is it just something I wish because faith, the faith I'm talking about is when you totally surrender your heart and your life to Jesus and then you allow him, as we saw in Paul and in Peter, to fill you, to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pray with you one more time. We're going to close. Thanks for this roller coaster ride. I'm sorry for the difficulty. It's, it's like every time we practice it, it goes great until we try to do it. And so I figure that's got to be the devil. Oh, well, that's a long gone life. Let's pray again. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the word going forth of it. I know that we're not returned for it. And I just pray, Lord God, that we'll grasp hold of who we really are. That in the name of Jesus, it's not about uh, us trying to do better. It's about realizing that our spirit man needs to be in charge of our soul. And as our spirit man takes over our soul, our flesh will begin to fall in place and do it likewise. We thank you today and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Hopefully next week we'll be back in the church. The governor lets us go. We'll be back. <laughs>